we approach the days of awe, the high holy days in the Jewish tradition, from which many great things that have endured in our culture continue, including these words drawn from the, from the Psalm number 150. Our Father and Mother and Sovereign of Mercies, we wish to be quit of all wars. Our Father and Mother and Sovereign of Mercies, inscribe us on the pages of life. The prayer for peace apparently goes yet unanswered, which is why we must pray it ever and ever again. And so we pray with a heartfelt wish and sing hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, sing hallelujah. Oh, sing hallelujah. All oh, praise be to you through the high arch of the heavens and praise be by sun, moon, and stars. My trumpet Our response of invocation is actually the, some of the words you just sang. They come out of the prophet Micah. Quickly before we start, you'll notice in my last portion, you'll see an odd word, Yah, which actually is the word for God in a summary form, often used in Hebrew, as in the word hallelujah. So I'm using here different words, holy one, Adonai, and Yah, because in the Jewish and the Islamic tradition, names for God are multiple. In fact, in the Islamic tradition, there are fabled 99 names. At least you only get three this morning. But I want you to know that as we approach these words from Micah, with what shall I come before the Holy One and bow myself before God on high? Will Adonai be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? God has told you, O oh mortal, what is good, and what does Yah require of you? Pretty straightforward advice, if you ask me. Somehow, though, we haven't quite gotten it right. Uh, our welcomer today is someone I encounter half naked, <laughs> which is to say that Cam and I bump into each other at the YMCA. He's a fist bump kind of guy, and he'll do it to me as we come up and down. But we see each other in our skivvies. He's better at it than I am. But he also chops a lot of wood, and I just chop up sentences. So it's a pleasure to hear him do the sentence chopping while I go and imagine chopping wood. I'd like you to welcome Cam Strife. Well, welcome to Fountain Street Church. As Fred said, my name is Cam Stridel. I've been a member here for, well, maybe not a, maybe not a written in the book member, but a member here for about 33 years. Uh, my wife Susan and I were married here 32 years ago, 33 years in March. Um, there's a, there's a, there are many reasons why I have found my way here at, at, to Fountain Street. I started out uh, in the Catholic tradition. Every Sunday, my family of 10 would hop in our station wagon and drive to the next town and go to the 8 o'clock Catholic service. We couldn't eat breakfast before then because uh, somehow food would interfere with the digestive process uh, when, you've, when you've taken in the host, I guess, some sort of mystery. and. Um, 
There were a lot of boundaries in that church. I went to Catholic school. Uh, we were told the, things to, the proper things to say to ensure uh, our entry into heaven and the things that, uh, that we couldn't do that would, uh, that would doom us to, to hellfire. And uh, I continue to encounter these types of beliefs. Um, my wife, Susan, has a childhood friend who invited us a few years ago to join her and her husband at, uh, for, at a restaurant in Holland and then go to a play afterward. The play was put on by Hope College students, uh, written, directed, and acted by them. And it was the, the same type of uh, belief that uh, good people who didn't believe in a certain way could be doomed forever to, to misery. And uh, I've always had a hard time believing that. Um, recently, I had a friend bump into me at a restaurant and, named Joe, and Joe said, hey, Cam, let's get together for a couple of beers. Sounded good to me. And uh, Joe and I weren't particularly close. I knew he had something up. And after buying a couple rounds, Joe said, Cam, you've got a decision to make. I said, what's that, Joe? Stout or porter? <laughs> he said, no. Do you want to uh, spend the rest of your, type, of your uh, eternity in the smoking or non-smoking section? <clears throat> well, I've always had a kind of a hard time with these sort of beliefs. My mother was a poet, uh, an accomplished one, and she was a lover of words. We'd, when we'd get together to pray at night, she, she had certain prayers that she liked, maybe not terribly traditional Catholic prayers, but one of my favorites and scariest ones at the time was, uh, goes as follows. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and to thou, O prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, thrust into hell, Satan and the other evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruination of souls. Wow, powerful stuff. <laughs> and, you know, my, it was funny because my parents didn't really believe these things. We, we were all going through the motions. And they taught us to, uh, to use our heads. They taught us about evolution, about nature. And you know, after going to Catholic school and, and reciting all these things week after week, if, you know, gradually you come to the conclusion that we're just, we're saying things over and over again that I, I doubted that very many of us really believed. But we were told if you think outside these boundaries, uh, bad things could happen. And it just seems to me that uh, much of the world lives with these shackles that uh, they just, if, if, they, if they were to look outside those boundaries, they could easily get rid of. Excuse me, just a moment. I put some notes that I haven't quite uh, put together here. At Fountain Street Church, when I came here, things were very different. Uh, Fountain Street doesn't discriminate. We don't tell our members what to believe. We don't threaten them with eternal misery or make promises of living over the rainbow. But we do embrace the rainbow. We're in the midst of conservative West Michigan. We're an oasis for people who want to explore their spirituality or lack thereof, or ideas without fear. We invite controversy. We don't hide from it. We display art all year round, not just during Art Prize, which takes on topics such as sexual slavery, gun control, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, politics, human sexuality, and its many vibrant forms. Our great spe speaker series may be unmatched anywhere in the country. Susan B. Anthony, Eleanor Roosevelt, Gloria Steinem, Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Winston Churchill, Linus Pauling. The list is enormous. I've been here to hear George McGovern, our very own David Hockenberry, Louis Farrakhan. Man, that was an interesting speech. I'm still waiting for Helen Keller and Amelia Earhart to come back as I missed them the first time around. From the pulpit, we discuss and explore any number of social issues. Nothing is off limits. Fred Wooden and other Fountain Streeters pay silent protest in front of the courthouse for LGBT rights. 
We collect money for Degage Ministries. We donate to Planned Parenthood, while other churches and institutions work feverishly to defund it. I don't want to say we're fearless, but we work to break down the barriers of fear, not build those barriers which so many faiths are built upon. Fountain Street Church, send us your tired, your poor, your other sexualized, your outcast poets and far-reaching thinkers. You have a home here. Sometimes a reading is a lesson. It always has something to teach if you listen. In the Jewish community this week, they're reaching the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And in that portion that they read is this portion, and it's at the end of that time when Moses is about to complete his work with the children of Israel, and he's talking to them. In fact, the whole book of Deuteronomy is one really long speech. And he's reminding all the people, because none of the people there, except he and three other people, were there when they left Egypt, according to the story. So he has to give them the message that their parents had heard at Sinai. And at the end he says, Moses, surely this instruction which I enjoin upon you this day is not too baffling for you, nor is it beyond reach. It is not in the heavens that you should say, should say, who among us can go up to the heavens and get it for us and impart it to us that we may observe it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who among us can cross over to the other side and get it for us and impart it to us? No, the thing is very close to you in your mouth and in your heart to observe it. Oscar Wilde, master of the bon mot, said America is the only country that went from barbarism to decadence without civilization in between. <laughs> Your laughter is one of recognition. Theodore Roosevelt, a man of great gifts and great flaws, said of all the questions which can come before this nation, short of the actual preservation of its existence in a great war. There is none which compares in importance to, with the great central task of leaving this land 
better for our descendants than it is for us. And in this season of living by heart, which means learning and remembering and giving and reciting, these famous words. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of it as a final resting place for those who gave their lives that this nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men who struggled here, living and dead, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is rather for us, the living, to be dedicated here, to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is for us, the living, rather, to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these men shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Of the people, by the people, for the people, misquoted, uh, by the way, on the monument out there, it was remembered. Words that actually have their origin and a great Unitarian minister. It goes uncredited, but there it was.
As I mentioned before, this is the time of year when Jews prepare for the High Holy Days, which consists of a celebration of the new year, the head of the year, Rosh Hashanah. But nine days after that, the day called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And all this month, observant Jews will go about begging forgiveness. Not from God. The theology of that community is really quite distinctive. It says, you may not ask God's forgiveness for sins committed against God until you have obtained forgiveness for the sins you've committed against your fellow humans. God cannot forgive the, er the errors of your ways between people. And so the custom is to go from one person to another, whether you, and to phrase it in something like this, if there is anything I have done to you in the past year that has given you harm or pain or offense, I humbly ask your forgiveness. And you do it to everyone because you may not remember doing it. And because, let's be honest people, we don't like asking humble anything. The practice of humility has been lost. It seems demeaning. And yet it is the most human thing we can do because the word human in English comes from the same word as humble, as humus, as in dirt. Just as it does in Hebrew, the word Adam, a man, comes from the word Adamah, the soil. In this month, we are invited to go back to the soil of our being to the place we stand, beneath our feet, the thing we look down upon quite literally when we stand up. And remember that that is the thing that gives us the ability to stand up. We go back to our foundations, to our origins, to our simplicity, to the dust of the earth. And therefore, our prayer today should be one of humility, of humbleness, of returning to where we began. Oh, you of 99 and 99 and 99 names, who exists and yet does not exist, who is present in the breath we breathe and in the falling of photons from stars upon our eyes, Shall we somehow get the strength to go humbly into the world and look each person we know in the eye and ask forgiveness? How can we bear it, knowing that sometimes we are asking from someone who has harmed us, knowing also that we have done more harm than we may know, that we may have to stand in front of someone who despises us or we them and ask for forgiveness. This is a hard thing. But as your poet, Mr. Rilke, said, all things important are difficult. We do not come here for the easy path but for the hard one, the one that requires that we climb over the rocks of our inadequacies, over the rubble of our ruinations, not to skip or saunter. We lift our hearts to you that we may humble ourselves to each other so that in the days to come, we may repair the world that we have broken. We take heart that those who went before us continue to animate our souls and give us love. And so we look back, especially this Sunday, on Louise Harris and Patricia Blackburn. They, among other witnesses who went before us, show us the way of humility and hope. 
And so we gather our strength in prayer and in the silence seek the strength to be humble. Holy One, filled with mercy, dwelling in the heaven's heights, bring rest beneath the wings of your Shekhinah, your presence, to those souls of our beloved and those who have gone to their eternal rest. May the one who is the source of mercy shelter them beneath the wings of eternity and bind their souls to you and to us that they may rest in peace, that we may be at peace, and let us always say, Amen. So I apologize first. People want church to be lively, joyful, exuberant. Nah. Not because it shouldn't be, but I think joy should be purchased righteously, not frivolously. And if you're walking in here today, you're looking for uplift, but you're also looking for truth, and sometimes the path to uplift is downhill before we can go uphill to sort through the thickets, the snares, the thistles, the rocks. And if you even turn on your television for five minutes, you have encountered a few thistles of late. And so I will not pretend they're not there. So I'll get started with apologies for not being more cheerful. Very close to you, the scripture says, very close. Moses is speaking, as I mentioned, and he means the covenant handed down on Sinai 40 years earlier, and he's telling the story to those who have grown up over the years and reminding them, if you follow these rules, you will survive and prosper. The rules are those that are summarized, not comprised, by what we call the Ten Commandments, the two tablets that are carried from place to place. This message, those ten summary laws, are what are in your mouth and in your heart. Many people memorize them. My message this autumn tries to be like that. 
that which is in our mouth and in our heart about our nation. That which makes us a great nation is not baffling, nor is it beyond reach, but very close to us. We hear it in Getty, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. We hear it in Emma Lazarus's poem. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Anyone hear that when they hear the immigration debate? Or Dr. King's dream, who in 1963 said, I have a dream that one day my four little children will be judged not by the, co not by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin, something we still have yet to accomplish almost 60 years later. This election season we're in drowns out that still small voice of America's truth. It, brown, it drowns it out with bluster and pontifications, with endless advertisements, oblique references and subtle put-downs. And my task, the one I've given myself, is to remind you of that still small voice of America, the words and hopes that you know by heart whether you have memorized them or not. The eloquent statement that serves as our national mission statement, the preamble to the Constitution, I believe should frame all of our thoughts and it frames all of my sermons in this month as we head toward the election. It's a summary of what American government exists to do. Let's call them the six commandments to form a more perfect union and all that stuff that comes after. There are six clauses, each of which are the purpose for our Constitution. My subject today is our imperfect domestic tranquility caught in that title, social insecurity. The phrase in the, in the preamble reaches back to the Declaration, which condemns the King of England for allowing domestic strife and even fomenting it. In that document, for those who know it, they say that he has excited domestic insurrections among us. Hmm. That's one of the reasons they're throwing off his rule. Now, you may not know that phrase, but it's important that you remember it because it itself is an oblique reference to slave uprisings because the British had already offered slaves their freedom if they would join the British army. So, yes, the Declaration of Independence criticizes the king for offering freedom to enslaved people because it was upsetting the nation, the states. It was. We need to remember that even our best moments are sometimes salted with our worst attitudes. A different insurrection after the war called Shays' Rebellion was lifted up by farmers in western Massachusetts who were being forced to sell their land to make their taxes, do, to pay their taxes because they didn't have money, and the only way they could get money was to sell their land on which they lived, by which they made their living. Why did they have to pay their taxes in coin? Because in Boston, the, tax, the debts owed to the, to the French were being paid in gold. And they thought it was unfair that those who won the war should have to go hungry to pay for it. What was the answer? The Constitutional Convention to the framers. Domestic tranquility was a real issue. Years later, in our own era, for some of us at least, our own Gerald Ford referred to those very words in his decision to pardon President Nixon, citing his responsibility, and I quote him now, not merely to proclaim domestic tranquility, but to use every means I have to ensure it. It lay behind Franklin Roosevelt's efforts to mitigate the Great Depression. His famous brain trust was criticized by conservative members of Congress for spending too much money, who believed the economy would sort it out in the long run. One of the members of his brain trust, Harry Hopkins, replied, people do not eat in the long run. Much of the New Deal was not about being nice. It was out of the very real fear of domestic strife that those who were falling into 
unemployment and homelessness would become restive, disorderly, desperate, and mount an insurrection. They knew about the bonus army. Do you? I have noted the division and disparity that we sense today in our nation. Like Ford and Roosevelt, we sense the danger of being too fragmented, and not just as a nation, not just politically, right here, everywhere, we can see these disjoinings, these fragmentations, some of which have been here a long time, some of which are a fruit of our politics. I'll talk about us for a moment. I want to talk about the people who have essentially lived on our portico every night, not always the same, for months and months, as we struggled with our duty or responsibility to those in our neighborhood. Now, it's come and gone and been worse and better, but our domestic tranquility has been troubled as we have found their presence, sometimes unhealthy, often unpleasant, and certainly troubling. But lately, to give you the news, the tranquility of those outside has been more troubled, especially by some who have abused our hospitality and our and their goodwill. And last week it became clear that any real long-term way to engage this population would take more, much too much time for us to ignore the present. And so we have thus imposed a no trespassing order effective tomorrow which means that anyone sleeping on or about the property after we're closed will be removed by the police. This does, I'm looking for the right words. No, it is not a solution. And in fact, I'm deeply saddened that we were in a position like this. Someone told me last week as we were sharing the news, it just doesn't seem right for a church to post no trespassing signs. She's right. Especially us. Thank you, Cam, for reminding me that we try to be a place where everyone belongs. But sometimes we want them to belong in ways they can't belong. And sometimes we want them to belong the way we want them to belong. It's natural. I'm not being critical, but observing that it is troubling. No church proclaiming that everyone belongs can also say in the same way that some are unwelcome. It just can't be done. Jesus of Nazareth, who remains a founding teacher of liberal religion, which sadly some conservatives don't recognize, spent his entire career among the poor, the lame, the psychotic, the outcast, he sent his disciples out to preach his message without money or food, which means they probably slept outdoors for more than a few nights. He said we should care for the least of these if we wish to follow in his path. Our action bespeaks our inability for the moment to walk that walk, to live by the better angels of our nature, as Lincoln asked so many years ago. And next week at a congregational town hall, I hope you will spend some time asking each other how we can do better in the future. Because banishment is not a solution. It just is not. By better, I mean more than money. We do give money, and I'm grateful that we do. There are agencies in town that support and help, and I'm glad that they do. But we still have in our community here, in our state, in our nation, a sense that we are over here and they should be over there. Has anyone seen the sign going up on the new building being built at the, near the corner of Fulton and Division? Luxury apartments making Heartside great again. Your moan tells me you find something more than a little ironic because when someone says we're going to make it great, what we mean is not poor. Our relationship to poverty in this country is scandalous. It's so scandalous that we prefer not to talk about it. And when we talk about solutions, we talk about them as something we can do for them. 
at what level, at what moment, will we as a society, we as a state, we as a city, even we as a church, begin to talk about not them, but those who are part of us. You may have seen them outside. Sometimes they visit inside. They have names. I've been learning them. I won't share them. It's not my job. I know one has bone cancer, one is deaf, two have full-time jobs, full-time jobs, but they don't pay enough to afford a place to live. There are singles, there are couples, there are male and female. They are not always straight. Several are over 65 and can't work anymore. Their reasons to sleep there or to rest here are as unique as you are. Although they are really no more dangerous than you or me, they are actually more at risk than you or me. These are the least of Grand Rapids. If they weren't, they wouldn't be here. And here we sit under the gaze of Jesus on the ceiling, and I wonder if that strikes us as at least a little ironic. But this is the state of the nation, not us. I do not criticize us particularly, but only for being part of a much larger, longer, and ingrained struggle we have with class and wealth and opportunity and equity. Whether about wealth or race or health or gender, we all sense a centrifugal motion pulling us apart rather than closer together. Fear of immigrants or Muslims, belief that the president is not a citizen or a Christian, people who call themselves preppers because they're stockpiling for social collapse, stockpiling guns. Do you realize 3% of Americans own 50% of the guns in this country? Why? So that when society falls apart, they will never lack for ammunition or guns. Less dramatically, schools today are almost as segregated as they were generations ago. Why? Because middle-class people, people more like you and me, have tended to move to suburbs for the better schools. But poorer people can't go there. And so they become darker and darker. The Brookings Institution has noted that rising income inequality means that those at the top use their resources to pay for housing in particular neighborhoods, resulting in increased, increasing segregation by income between neighborhoods over the past four decades. We flee from the poor. We really do. Here in the Midwest, to change it into a slightly different conversation, only one in three white people has an ongoing familiarity, meaning a person they know of color. One in three. That means most of us can go through the whole day not encountering a person of color at all. That's according to CNN. Grand Rapids is listed as the 26th most segregated city in the country, and we're not that big. Our domestic tranquility is threatened by walls erected by race and wealth and gender and class, religion. The same Alexis de Tocqueville who admired us so much in his visit in the 1830s looked upon his native France on the eve of its, after its revolution and surmised, Quote, society was cut in two. Those who had nothing united in common envy. Those who had anything united in common terror. We're not there, but we're way closer than I think we want to be. The ancient Greek Plutarch said, an imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be rich and poor, but I think we are out of balance. Our local inability to find a solution for our poor means that all around us we lack the solutions to deal and help. And certainly the politicians are not talking about it, but as I have pointed out in the last few weeks, maybe if we talk about it, they'll have to talk about it. It shouldn't be about walls, but about ways Perhaps we should come up with some ideas, and maybe they should listen. For example, 
I ask this question. I would put it to the candidates if I could. I'd put it to all the candidates in Congress, too. What if every child born in this country had health coverage and enough to eat and clothes to wear and a decent place to live? Hey, that sounds extravagant. But when we means test welfare, we are punishing the child, not just the parent. When we tell people they have to work in order to get health coverage, I, do we actually mean we want four- and five-year-olds getting jobs? No. Yes, health care costs alone for children under 18 amounted to $207 billion, half of that to hospitalizations, many of which would not happen if there was food, clothing, shelter, and adequate preventative care in the first place. Yes, we're talking about real money. Yes, it would be expensive, but tell me, if we can't afford poor, uneducated children, we really can't afford poor, uneducated adults. What do you think our prisons hold anyway? Let's admit that also that education is still profoundly unequal in ways that hurts the entire nation. We all want our children to excel, but do we really want other children to fail in order to make that work? because that's what we do in the way we spend and staff our schools. And these days, even a good high school education it is, and is insufficient. Community college is necessary to have a job worth holding. That should be part of our public education system. And that, in turn, would make four-year colleges a lot more co less costly in the state. And that would make college education a lot less costly and less difficult to obtain. Many of the poor and homeless are there for medical reasons. The number one cause of bankruptcy in America, personal bankruptcy, health. Unable to pay one's medical bills. Substance abuse is a common reason for failed families and ruined lives. What would it take for us to do something about it before it happens so that we weren't always cleaning up what we could not have had to spill in the first place? What would it actually cost? Would it be worse than the House of Cards health care delivery system we have now? I want to know. Mrs. Clinton, I want to know. Mr. Trump, I want to know. Mr. Reid, I want to know. Mr. Mitchell, McC McConnell, I want to know why we are not doing this. They should not be asking us why we should. We should be asking them why we should not. Our domestic tranquility is nothing other than the health of our community, which does not stop at our front portico, or our town line, or our school districts. A nation segmented and segregated by wealth and race eventually loses its heart. We need a spirit of cooperation as well as competition, of collaboration as well as innovation. These are the habits of our heart that keep it beating instead of breaking. I know that sounds naive, but the promises of the Declaration and the Constitution were naive in their day, and look where we have come so far. I am no communist, but I do believe community is as American as individuality. I am no Puritan, but I believe we have responsibilities as well as rights. There is no me in America without we and no rights without the duty to do right. I think it is time, in some ways, for America to grow up. We're all acting like adolescents. We're the, we're the nation of you're not the boss of me. Yeah, take over your own blessed life. Time to grow up. What do they say now? Put on your big boy and your big girl pants and act like grown-ups, please. And I don't mean candidates. I mean every. That's what the greatest generation did, right? Put on its big boy pants, put on its big girl pants, came back and built a country rather than ask their country to build them. If we want to be great again, we the people have to be great enough for our leaders to be good enough. If we want a better government, we need to be a better people. All right, that'll have to do.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found true in thy sight. Thou who art my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Someday, someday, says Emma Goldman, men and women will rise, they will reach the mountain peak, they will meet big and strong and free, ready to receive, to partake, and to bask in the golden rays of love. What fancy, what imagination, what poetic genius can foresay the potentialities of such a force in the life of men and women? That is the hope we hold that presses us forward to be dedicated to those things which are worthy of our dedication. And though we make it not today or tomorrow, we know that every day indeed is a day which the Lord has made. Let us ever rejoice and be glad in it. Uh.